Okay, can you record now? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Wow, okay. So I just want to thank uh, Gary and uh, for inviting me and Don for helping me with the, with the Zoom and everybody for joining this afternoon. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's in the morning or in the evening, wherever you guys are all over the world, but really thank you so much. I'm, I, I so appreciate this opportunity. Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen. I hope it comes on. Okay. okay. Um, does it come on? Okay, great. So um, the, the talk is representing Israel in Indonesia. And I've been very fortunate, my wife and I, to be the Israeli representatives um, at uh, three international exhibitions in Indonesia. And uh, what happened is I first became a commissioner in South Africa in 2010. And I've been collecting stamps since I was the age of six. I first collected dogs and cats, and then I collected Jerusalem. And um, I just got very involved in stamps. And when I made Aliyah in 94, um, I, I started going to the meetings. And I became very friendly with the, uh, the philatelists here in Israel. And um, they were just so accommodating and so um, accepting of me, even though my, my Hebrew wasn't that great. They once asked me to give a talk because I later started collecting Mozambique. And it was at the uh, Harris Museum. And I, I had shown the uh, exhibit that I had done in, in London. And um, in the middle of my talk, they said rather, speak in, in English, but they were really nice. And from that moment onwards, I just developed a very special connection with most, well, with all these Israeli philatelists that um, uh, it was wonderful. And then in 2010, they had an international exhibition in Johannesburg and uh, I was the commissioner. It was the first time I'd ever been a commissioner at an international exhibition uh, where I met different, um, all different philatelists and judges. And I found it to be absolutely amazing. And then two years later in Indonesia, in 2012, invitation was sent to Israel. And uh, with Indonesia being the largest Muslim country in the world, um, Israel and Indonesia to this very day, they don't have, um, they don't have uh, diplomatic relations, but uh, they did send the invitation to Israel and they were having also FIP Congress at the end of the, the exhibition. And I was going to be the Israeli um, representative at that Congress. And having a South African passport, I could actually go into Indonesia on my South African passport. So um, I made contact with the, they, we were in contact via email and um, it was, the contact with the Indonesians was actually really nice. And we were sending different emails and they told me the, the dates and, um, when I would be there and then I saw that the date was going to be that we had to arrive in Jakarta on, on Shabbat. So I just mentioned to the, um, the officials that, you know, we, uh, my wife and I observed Shabbat. Is there any way we could come on the Sunday? And they were extremely accommodating and they said, no problem. Later on, I realized it was a major problem because the customs were, it was, it's very strict there and they had to especially get um, the own people to open the customs again and to especially um, permit my wife and I to come through and through the customs. But what happened is while we were in the middle of our discussions, they sent bulletins and I was quite surprised to see because the exhibition was actually funded by the um, city of Jakarta and the Indonesian Post. So it's a governmental, it's not private, it's a governmental um, uh, exhibition that was sponsored by the, the government. And I'm going to go into the second slide. Um, so this was the uh, official brochure that they sent. And I was so shocked to see that I was very su surprised to see that they put my name and they put the flag of Israel. And this was also on the website, uh, having um, the different commissioners and there was uh, my name with the Israeli flag. And I also saw that there was somebody coming from Iran. And uh, in 2012, uh, so this very day, the relations between Iran and Israel, it's, um, 
not the warmest. So it was a little bit, um, it was a little, you know, we didn't know what to really expect. But I was really, really impressed that they clipped the flag of Israel. And this is also on the official website. And um, this is the one actually coming where they gave the address. And they, even though I came in on a South African passport, they did mention that I was from Israel and with the Israeli flag there. Um, then what happened is um, when we, just before we arrived to Indonesia, I was um, in Singapore for Shabbat. And we went to the main shore, um, beautiful shore, and we met the rabbi and the community. And while we were having our lunch there, it was a communal lunch, Israeli diplomats who also come to shore on, it's like a communal event. They heard that we were heading out to Jakarta and they said, well, you, you mustn't go with Yamulka, you might land up like Ron Arad. So we were a little bit nervous. So I thought, you know, I'll wear a cap when I get to the airport and I'll wear a cap when I'm in, in, in you know, when I'm in Indonesia. Anyway, when we arrived, going into the customs at Jakarta Airport, we saw the sign, which was a little bit unnerving, death penalty for drug traffickers under Indonesian law. But that wasn't going to be an issue because we weren't taking any drugs with us. But it was a little bit, uh, when you come to a country and you see a massive sign like this in front of you, we really didn't know what to expect. But as we got to the airport and we passed through customs and then there was an official waiting for us, and they took us in the car and we went in straight to the convention center and they were so so friendly and i thought you know i've never worn a cap i'm just going to take it off and i was wearing my yamulke and i thought what will be will be so when we got to the uh this is when we arrived at the um we just went to our hotel to freshen up and then we went to the opening ceremony you can see the people were smiling and uh just so um so welcoming um they, they go with their hands like this because it's 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 a way of welcoming you people and uh everybody was so happy and i think they were very very grateful that we made the effort to come there were unfortunately quite a few european countries that didn't go to that exhibition and it was surprising but they felt maybe it's a third world country but whoever did come they made them very very welcome that's it's also part of the tradition um, so this is a video of the opening ceremony. Those were all the commissioners. And the, the mayor of Jakarta was there, the governor from um, that province where Jakarta is was also, and it had very wide um, press coverage. Oh yeah, then I have to do the next one. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I don't know how to get out of the video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um oh, yeah. sorry. And maybe I'm just going to Okay, so now I find it. Okay, this was the uh, the traditional Indonesian dance. They put on such a wonderful um, show for all the visitors. It was very exotic. You see uh, Indonesian traditional um, music and 
it was just very colorful and very, very, it was just so exotic in a way, but it was really nice. They really went out of the way and they made everybody feel so welcome and accommodating. Now, this is the um, President uh, Suharto. He was the second president of Indonesia. And if you look closely, it's a collage of stamps that was made in the, the president's um, image with thousands of stamps. It was uh, actually really nice. Um, this was at the, at the opening. And um, these were um, officials from the Indonesian post. See, everybody was smiling and um, just very, very uh, welcoming. This was the one evening where they had a gala dinner with um, my wife and one of the Indonesian ladies. Um, he was actually from Bahrain and so friendly. It was amazing because I wore my yamaka and we all got on very well. In fact, there was no one that um, didn't want to take a photograph together and most people, most Indonesians had never seen anybody wearing a yarmulke or even meeting anybody from Israel. So um, it was it was really something I was it was a great privilege to to be there and to meet with somebody for the first time from Bahrain. This is a philatelist from Saudi Arabia that I met and um, I gave him covers from Israel and he gave me from Saudi Arabia. So we met the Egyptian uh, judge and his wife, and I had been, and my wife had been to, my wife had been before, uh, she had been um, to Luxor, and she had been on the, the Nile, on the tour, and I had been to Cairo and Alexandra. Um, there were many times that I'd go back to South Africa via Egypt Air, and I spent a bit of time in Cairo as well. So we had so much to discuss about uh, Egypt and Israel and the relations. And nothing was, you know, we could speak openly, um, politics, anything. It was actually very, very um, interesting that people were very open and they asked me many questions about Israel and people were fascinated. Here was the, the one in the middle is from Mongolia. I never met anybody from Mongolia before. And on the left from India. And the commissioner from India, the one on the left, in South Africa, he was also the commissioner there. And he, in, in South Africa, two years before, he never spoke to the Pakistani commissioner. There was a big tension between the two of them. And I thought, you know, I know they both, um, they love cricket. So I approached both of them and I started speaking cricket from the three of us. And all of a sudden we had found a common language between the three of us and we just compared Tenduka and uh, Khan and uh, Bacha who's my, my, my brother's wife is from the Bacher family, and we all got him very well. So you develop this friendship. And when I, I met him in, in Jakarta two years later, we just got him very well. This is my wife at, uh, there's a very big um, tower in Jakarta. This is the main tower of Jakarta. And these are the local girls. At the top of the tower, it, it, they have it in, in gold, but you can go to the top of the tower and you have a beautiful panoramic view of, of Jakarta. And what was amazing is that the people that we met there, it's not a tourist destination, Jakarta. So they looked at us, they, they, had very, they, they really see Westerners in, in that part of Jakarta. So for us seeing girls with uh, the Khabib, it was it was very wonderful how the interaction was between between us and the local people as well. Now, at the end of the um, exhibition, on the last day, this was the FIP Congress. And the FIP Congress, they, they have it every couple of years. It's like a mini United Nations. We have all the different countries and um, the commissioner from Ireland um, didn't attend. So they put, it was Japan, Israel, and the next to me is Iran. 
And I really didn't know how I was going to react sitting because it's a whole day event and you discuss many issues at the FIP. When's the next Congress going to be? And everything related to philately and um, and um, what, what should be exhibited at the different um, exhibitions and the classes and the rules. There's a lot of negotiations going on and a lot of voting. But if, about a day or two before this, the Iranian's daughter actually came up to my wife and I, and she said in perfect English, how are we keeping kosher in Jakarta? And we couldn't believe it because that really broke the ice. So um, we just got on so well and we started speaking and um, the father, um, he was actually a stamp dealer and he had been a stamp dealer for many years in Tehran. And um, he told me that he once dealt with the Israeli stamps before the, before the Shah was deposed. And we had a marvelous day. We discussed, I'd seen, there was an Iranian movie that won the Oscars that I'd actually seen. And we would just discuss so many different topics and we exchanged emails. This photograph, I'm just showing you because it's a closed, um, but I promised that I wouldn't show this. Uh, when I got back to Israel, people heard that I was, I was close with the Iranian and they wanted photographs to put in the newspapers and um, we kept it very private. So I promised them that I wouldn't do that. And um, we just, through, we kept in touch by email and we just developed a very close friendship. So here we're shaking hands together. And it was really, really, I was, a, to be honest, I was a bit nervous before I went because I didn't know how I would interact with the Iranian, but we just got on extremely well. And then Haaretz, after the exhibition, they came to my home. I don't know that we're going to do this, but they did a little interview. Okay, I just want, must mention, um, when I actually gave the, um, I bought quite a few covers that the Philatelic Federation had given me, and I bought my own covers as well, and there were many children, they encouraged the children to come to the exhibitions, they bust them in, um, I'm just going to continue, um, and they were so happy to, to receive the covers, and they knew it was from Israel, and no one said, I don't want it. They were, it was really like I had given them gold. For me, that was, it was so heartwarming. So when I came back, the Times of Israel, they asked me to write an article. And um, it appeared in a few publications. There was also one in the, I think it's called the Jewish Times of Asia. Yeah, this is the uh, Jewish Times of Asia. And which is in Hong Kong and all the different um, the, for the Jewish community in, in, in Asia. And because of this article, I received a message from a very interesting fellow, which I'm going to show you now. His name's Yaakov Baruch. 
an amazing um he sent me a, a an email saying that he grew up um as part muslim part christian and only at the age of 16 but I, did his grandmother tell him that he was jewish and today he's the only religious jew in the whole of indonesia it's quite incredible but i met him when he was already had started his journey and we just got on um extremely well we um Okay, so with Yaakov Baruch, um, he decided to um, investigate his Jewish roots. He only found out when he was 16, his grandmother told him that he was Jewish. He went to Singapore, and in Singapore, he met the rabbi, and um, he just felt he had such a love for, 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 for Judaism that he decided to become more religious, and he studied quite a bit, and, um, and we've been in touch ever since. And he asked me if I could send him an etrog for, um, for Sukkot. He never, ever had seen an etrog. And because I had sent by the post to Indonesia, and they had sent me as well, because the, the postal service had actually worked. They sent me the bulletins and, and the envelopes for the exhibition. I actually sent him in, in a box, in a container, an etrog. It arrived just after Sukkot, but it was the first time he had ever seen it. And he planted it, and for the next, uh, it's still growing, and uh, he has etrog there in, in Indonesia. What had happened is the Indonesian, from Indonesia, from the FIP Congress, that relationship that I had with the Iranian commissioner, we, um, we would contact each other, and then I heard very sad news about a year later, he had passed away. And I sent a letter to the family um, sending them condolences uh, that, that I was very, really, very fond of their father. And his son, who's on the left, he actually wrote back to me saying he appreciated um, the email that I'd sent. And I actually sent the email in those days, there wasn't Gmail, it was through NetVision. So it was netvision.net.il. So they received the email from Israel in Tehran. And he replied to me saying that he is going to be in. Um, in Australia the following year in 2013, and he'd like to meet. And we met in um, at that exhibition in Melbourne. Um, on the, the middle is the Turkish commissioner, who happened to be Jewish, amazing. And on the right is Hani, he's the commissioner from, from Egypt. But I developed also a very, very close connection with his son and, his, and my wife and his wife. We just get on very well and we, maintain this connection through the years. Now, his son brought some, a very special present for me. This is a catalog that was printed in Iran, and you can see it's from his, uh, of Israeli stamps, in Persian. And this was printed before the, uh, the, the Shah was deposed. And they used to sell this catalog in the stamp shop, and they had many Jewish clients. So he had one left and he gave it to me and it's my, one of my prized possessions. So if, um, in 2017, um, it was the, um, in Bandung, Bandung is the third largest city in, uh, in Indonesia, in West Java. They were having a world stamp exhibition and again, they, they sent an invitation to Israel, and I was asked if I could be the commissioner. And um, my wife and I, we were very glad, and we felt it was such an honor to, um, to represent Israel again. And it was going to be held um, in, in the city of Bandung. Um, I had never really heard of the city of Bandung. The only um, idea of Bandung I ever heard is I once went to a... Um, a conference on, on Dutch um, Jews that were saved in the Shire. And I met a lady who told me that well, they tried to escape from, from Holland and they went to Australia. And in Perth, where they tried to disembark, the officials said you have to go back on the boat, you're not accepted. 
And because they were Dutch citizens, they both then went off to was, uh, the Dutch East Indies, which is today Indonesia. And she landed up in the war years in the city of Bandung. So that was the only, the only time I'd ever heard of Bandung before. But we went there and it's a very, very modern city and um, very Dutch city as well with many old Dutch buildings. And it's in West Java where they took us to, uh, just outside the city, you see actual volcanoes. So when you hear of volcanic eruptions in Indonesia, it's in this part of the country. So, so as you can see, uh, the, the connection that, uh, that I developed with the Indonesian Post and the workers there, I also gave them a lot of first day covers of, of Israel. And they saw me with the Yamulka and they asked me to teach them a few words in Hebrew. It was just so heartwarming. It was amazing. I don't know how about this isn't really going. Um, okay. It's just one of the, the, the lovely families that I had met that just came up to me and were so friendly. I'm having a bit of difficulty going to the next one. Okay. So I must just tell you, I, I would never have dreamt that in the middle of Bandung, where there really are no li Jews living there, that I would meet an Indonesian from Bali who was singing Hinei Matovi. It came as, it was just incredible. I couldn't believe, and we just met, and he saw me with the Yamulka, and he came up to me, and he said, welcome to Indonesia. And he said, you know, I asked him, how do you know about a Yamulka, and how do you know about Israel? And he said, I, I know some, some Jewish songs. And he started seeing that for me. Uh, it was just, it was unbelievable.
So this was one of the workers who was at the exhibition and he saw me, he asked me if I have a spare yarmulke. And I actually did have one. And I asked, why, why are you so interested? He said his father was Jewish and uh, he loved anything about uh, Judaism. And I was just blown away and that he knew Havana Gila and Havana Shalom. It was just amazing. And we've also kept in touch um, from that exhibition. And I actually met him now in Jakarta um, a few months ago. So now we were supposed, to, yeah, this was last year. What happened is because of the corona, it was going to be the world championship in 2020 in, um, in, 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 in Jakarta, and it had to be postponed. And um, eventually they decided that they would, they would have the exhibition. Uh, finance was a bit of an issue because uh, of the world economic, um, what was going on. But again, I was so honored that they asked my wife and I if we could go to Indonesia for that exhibition. And um, this time we went via Dubai, um, and um, which was in itself incredible because I don't know if you guys know, in Dubai, there's a Holocaust museum as well. And I met the founder of that museum and um, uh, there's so many Israelis going to Dubai, but the stopover in Dubai and the connection part um, with Emirates it was, it was, it was amazing. But the exhibition in um, the World Champ Championship now, which happened just a few months ago in Jakarta, was very special because there I met again a lot of the um, philatelists, a lot of the people that I had met, um, it was 10 years before when we first came to, um, to Jakarta. So it was held at the uh, International Expo, uh, beautiful uh, exhibition grounds. This was at the opening ceremony. And what's interesting here, I'm sitting next to the uh, Pakistani uh, commissioner and on his um, left is the commissioner from Iraq. And we sat next to each other. The Iranian commissioner didn't come to Jakarta, but the Iraqi one did. And at the FRP Congress, we sat next to each other. And I, I really asked him, I said, and I knew it was very controversial, I said, could we take a, a picture together? He said, it can't be together. We can have it in a group, but not together. And the reason is that Miss, um, when they had the Miss World, the contestant from Iraq took a selfie together with the Israeli contestant and the family were threatened. And I think they had to leave. Um, they were really, I think the, the death sentence was imposed upon them. It was really pretty serious. So this, he, you know, it was okay. We sat next to each other. No one said to me, um, no, I don't want to be in any picture with Israel. It was actually quite unbelievable. Um, I'll just go, okay. Here we are. Um, he's the actually the commissioner from the UAE, from Dubai. Wonderful person. He actually got on extremely well. And I don't know if you know Yigal Netanel. Yigal is the Israeli... Um, he's a judge. He um, he sits on the board of the FIP, and Yigal is a very very close and dear friend. His um, his collection on the cherry blossom issue of Japan won the Grand Prix. Um, it was it was the top collection, and um, he he has a very close. Um, he's been involved in Israeli philately for many many years as an exhibitor, then a judge, and then um, with Eli Weber, they, they run the Israeli Philatelic Federation. And Yigal was asked to stand on the elections to the FIP. And what was incredible is that the person that he was running against was Chris King from the Royal. And um, we all thought, oh, it's gonna be embarrassing because uh, how can somebody from Israel run against um, somebody who was very involved in the royal uh, from the UK, from England? And to the surprise of, of nearly everyone, Yigal actually won that election. And he got votes from the majority of the Muslim world, which is really quite unbelievable. So Yigal, uh, they had elections again for the FIP and Yigal was unopposed. So he came. Um, Yigal was also with me in Bandung. And in Bandung, 
um, in 2017, um, he couldn't go in on his Israeli passport, but he had to get a special, a special passport, um, a diplomatic passport. So he was in Singapore for a few weeks till they processed his passport, and only at the very last moment was it issued. But Yigal has since got an EU passport, so now he can travel. And he came with his wife, and it was just wonderful, um, you know, being together uh, in Jakarta. And we were both together at the FIP Congress. Now, the head of the Indonesian Philatelic Federation is uh, Dr. Fadli Zon. He's also um, a uh, member of the parliament, very influential, and I had met him. And uh, here he is, and we had a, a picture together, which was really nice. And he asked me if I knew uh, various Israeli politicians that he had met, and there he was very, very obliging to have a picture of me wearing a yarmulke. And um, actually, we had the Palmyra ceremony in the parliament in Jakarta. Um, I think it possibly could be the first time that anybody wearing a yarmulke has been in the parliament of, of uh, Indonesia. Now, I mentioned Jakob Baruch. Uh, he's the person that I, that was in touch with me and he came to Israel and we met at the Kotel. So here, um, he especially came to Jakarta. He lives in Manado, which is it's a, more than an hour flight away from Jakarta. And next to him is Maureen Hanna. She's head of the Jewish community of, of uh, Jakarta, uh, of Indonesia. There are very few Jews, there's not even a minion, but she heads the community. And Yaakov decided to build a synagogue in his hometown. And he built a synagogue. And then he, because he found that he, his grandmother was originally of Dutch descent, he found that a lot of his family from his grandmother's side were actually killed in, in, in the Shoah, in the Holocaust. So he decided with his own uh, to build a Holocaust museum. And it's the only Holocaust museum in, in Indonesia. And I gave him uh, a hard drive of a lot of the videos that I had taken. And um, we correspond on a weekly basis. And he especially came through to Jakarta to meet with my wife and I. And he asked me for a talus. And when I told, I bought the talus at one of the, um, the Judaica dealers in Jerusalem. And I told him I want to buy some yarmulkes. He said, just please take these yarmulkes, whoever wants them. It's his gift to any, anyone in Indonesia who wants a yamaka. But he was so grateful. And I was so appreciative that he actually came all the way to meet with us. Okay, now what was very unique about uh, the Jakarta exhibition is that I decided one of the exhibitors from Israel, I took quite a few exhibits. I had mine on the, on, on the Bible and I had one on, on Jerusalem, but there was one, a tour of Jerusalem in postcards. Postcards with the uh, stamps of, of Jerusalem. It was 80 page with different views, different postcards of Jerusalem. And it's the first time that an Israeli theme exhibit was ever exhibited in, in Jakarta. So it was interesting to see what the reaction would be. So here, if you look closely uh, in the background, you'll see uh, this is it's from Paolo Dweck, who's um, an Israeli exhibitor, and this is his postcard collection. You'll see the Magand of it, and you'll see also the Israeli flag. And a lot of the, the young children, the school children, came up to my wife and I and they said, can we interview you? And they asked me to explain um, the, the exhibit on Jerusalem. It was, out of all the exhibits that I bought, this was the most popular one. Although it didn't win like a gold medal or anything, but it warmed everybody's hearts up. It was absolutely unbelievable. I'm just gonna go, I think I took another video of it.
So what was amazing, you heard a lot of noise in the background. The exhibit was very, very well attended. There were many, many school kids that came. And a lot of the school kids came up to my wife and I, and they wanted us to explain this exhibit. And what really, for them, they had never really seen snow before. And to show them the beautiful snow-covered uh, Kotel and the Dome of the Rock, um, they just loved it. And when I showed them that Jews, Arabs, Christians all get on, you know, in the old city of Jerusalem, they they really, they, they, they were asking us so many questions. And it was just, it was wonderful. It really was so special. Uh, Les, when you show videos, people can't hear. Do you need to explain what's um, spoken or what sounds are in the video? Uh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. 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 Okay, so this is um, a watermelon and it's carved philately. So, um, you know, the, the whole thing about stamps that, uh, as just as a stamp knows, they travel oceans and seas throughout the world and they know no borders. Um, having been three times to Indonesia and having met the, the people and having met the different philatelists and the dealers and the judges and the commissioners, we really felt that we really are like a family of nations. Uh, we might have different religions and different races, but we all had a love of philately and, um, and we developed this very close friendship that um, I correspond with many of the commissioners. And um, it was just such an honor and a privilege to represent Israel in Indonesia. And, um, for me to see the youngsters, because that's the future of the hobby, to see them so excited to receive a first day cover or a postcard or a stamp from Israel, I thought it, it was just, it was, it was wonderful. It was so heartwarming. And, um, and it's really lovely. You know, stamps really break down barriers. And it's like an ambassador for, for a country because it showcases the different... Um, um, you know, so many things in the stamp, in the life of a country and the different views and the different uh, aspects of different countries are displayed on the stamp that travels all over the world. And going to these exhibitions, and I'm really grateful to these Israeli exhibitors that interested me with their very valuable exhibits. And they were really appreciated by, by everybody who went to see them. And um, I just hope that the hobby continues and it goes from strength to strength. But what I found very, very, very um, positive is that in, in especially in, in Indonesia, where a lot of children were very, very um, involved, they, they encouraged the children, they, they gave them stamps, and the hobby is well and alive, and it's doing well. And in Israel as well, if you go to the exhibitions that we have here in Jerusalem, it's very well attended. And um, and we just hope that we encourage the hobby to grow and um, it should just continue and people should just gain so much from it. So I want to thank you all. I hope from the videos it gave you a bit of an insight into a different type of world, but uh, a very special world and um, such an honor and a privilege to have represented Israel there. So if there's any questions, if I can answer, Anybody got any questions for Les? Well, one thing I noticed, and he just uh, talked about it, was how many youth there were at, yeah. at the show. Uh, you go to a U.S. stamp show, and, and you see mostly gray hair, bald heads, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the average age of the attendant is extremely high compared to, to overseas. Okay, so Lee, can I comment? You know, they this year was a the last year was a little bit difficult because so many of the um, the conferences and the exhibitions were supposed to happen during Corona and they were postponed. So last year, wow, we had there was an exhibition in London in February, 
it's actually coming up to while I was at that exhibition, there was something also quite interesting. The Israeli flag was taken down. Somebody took it down and I had to get another one. But in London, there were very few children that came to that exhibition. And also in Toronto, they had a wonderful exhibition in Toronto. It was a one frame. And what I found, very, it was such a successful exhibition, but I never saw many children there. Uh, in November, we had an exhibition in, in Cape Town, in South Africa. And what they did is that they, they brought in children from the disadvantaged communities. So it was wonderful to see a lot of the school children were actually brought in by buses uh, every day and they had seminars for the children, encouraging the children. So in maybe the, the less developed countries like South Africa and um, Indonesia, Israel, a lot of the religious kids are still very involved in STEMs, but in these countries, um, the, the kids are still very involved, and um, and the hobby is really, it's, there is a future, because the kids, you know, the, the kids are the future of the hobby, but it's the organizers, they really need to get the children involved. But you're right, if you go to a lot of, like, I was really quite surprised, in London, at the, it was also, it was a world exhibition in February. There were very few children at that exhibition. And unfortunately, also in Toronto, I didn't see many children, which is a pity. It's a great pity. This was very you, interesting. Did, did you have trouble with customs getting in and out of uh, uh, the various countries? Okay. So, um, yeah, the customs is a very, very big issue. Also here in Israel. It's, it's each page, uh, especially in Israel, Israel is very strict. Each page um, has to be photocopied. And then before you leave the country, you go to the customs and they actually check each page. And before they used to stamp, the customs stamp on each page. Now, because it takes so long, it can take a couple of hours, they just choose a few pages per, per exhibit. So, uh, and then when you go through Ben Gurion, there's a special customs department where you have to fill out the forms. And when you come in, you have to declare them as well. So now in the beginning, they didn't know what was going on and they always have different officials and it would take forever. But now I think they, we, we've got it down to quite a fine art because sometimes we could spend hours at the customs because nobody knew, they see all these stamps coming back and they didn't know what was going on. But now they've really, um, I, sometimes I was delayed at customs coming back into Israel and they wanted me to leave the stamps, which you can't, because what's also interesting is some of the stamps, especially the, those that I took to London, were extremely valuable. I mean, they, some of them were worth more than a million, a couple of million even. And they, they're only insured if they're with me. I can't put them in the hole. So when I'm on the plane, they have to be in my hand luggage which is another issue because you can be overweight. And that actually happened when I was in Australia, I was overweight and I had to buy a first class ticket, my daughter and myself. And even then I was overweight and I had to put one collection in the hole and that was my collection. <laughs> but um, it's, they're very strict with the, with the insurance. It, it, it has to be with the commission all the time. And when I came to Canada, to Toronto, they had forgotten to send me the one form um, in Toronto um, at the customs. So they said, you can't go through with it. You have to leave it here. I said, but I can't, I, can, I can't leave it here. And uh, it was a major issue. I had, to, I had to leave it there with his assurance and I got him to sign. And then I had to make a photocopy and then they had to bring me the form that they had forgotten to send me. And then it was released. But it's a big worry. It's a major worry. Now what happened in Indonesia when we first went, wow, the customs in Bandung and in Jakarta in 2012 and 2017, they were extremely strict. Now we just walked through and we said, but what about customs? So they said, no, don't worry, you just go through. So certain countries, they don't really worry and certain countries, they really do. They take it extremely seriously. And just a comment, um, when my son did uh, birthright, and it was in Jerusalem. He went to the philatelic agency there in the post office, and they were just so nice to him. They gave him yearbooks. They gave him children's wow. Hebrew books. They 
they they spent a lot of time with him. So thank you. Yeah, I, it, it it was a great experience for him. Now this last year, now the Philatelic yes. Federation. You are able to get around with any. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> can you just stop sharing the screen, that, um, and then we can all see each other? Oh, okay. okay. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, stop. See. Okay. There we go. Oh, much That's better. Right. Much better. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Wes, did you uh, did you visit a synagogue in Indonesia? Okay. So there was once a synagogue in Surabaya. But it was actually with the intifada, it was actually destroyed. Every single brick in the shul was destroyed. And Yaakov Baruch, he actually built his shul in Manado. That's quite far out. It's quite far away from, from Jakarta. And when you go to the exhibitions, you, you can't really leave because every day there's conferences. And so I couldn't. Um, so that's the only synagogue that there is in, in Indonesia. But um, so I actually didn't. But what was nice is that Maureen Hanna, who's head of the Jewish community, she's she actually came to Jerusalem uh, with Yaakov, and um, so I just met the head of the community. And but in Jakarta, there's no synagogue actually. They say in Bali, um, when they have the tourist seasons, Chabad, they do it very secretively, but they try to have a minion, but very secretively in Bali. But what Yaakov Baruch's done, and it's been amazing, and maybe I can share it with you. He did a his Holocaust museum that he's got, and I've sent him some videos related to Dutch Jews that survived the war. Um, he's had the German ambassadors come all the way to where he stays in Manado to this exhibition, and Yad Vashem helped him with um, you know material for the exhibit, and it's been amazing. And he's sure. He does run a show and um, it's very hard to get a minion, but he does what he can, which is, it's, it's remarkable. Yes, do, do most people speak English? Yes, uh, I found most did. Um, yeah. uh, what, there was also a bit of Dutch coming from South Africa, you know, with Afrikaans, I could understand. Mm -hmm. But yeah, most of, there were some that don't. Um, what, what had happened is the Commissioner General um, hardly spoke any English, and somebody else, uh, his name's Tono, he just took over and he helped us, but um, uh, it's it's also very, um, the people were just very nice, and most people, even if they don't speak English uh, in Jakarta, you can get around, we got around pretty well. The hotel where we stayed at was very interesting, it was a government hotel, because financially they, um, I think they are struggling financially with uh, the finances. And literally about 100 meters away, you'll see a third world country. I actually walked around and I videoed, I actually put it on, my, on, on the YouTube, you'll see people living in squalor. And here we were staying in, it was like a four-star hotel, but for them, it's like a 10-star hotel. It's like two different worlds right next to each other. Yes. Benjamin Netanyahu considered he putting you on the Abraham Accord Committee. <laughs> You're very funny. No, but you know what? It was very, very interesting because um, what I found with this is that it really is a governmental... I mean, you have the the Minister of Post and Telecommunication and it's uh, the Governor of uh, Jakarta and the Mayor of Jakarta. Mm. So it was... And it's on the official website of Indonesia. But... What, the one country that is very, very anti-Israel is Malaysia. Funny enough, Indonesia, there's a lot of trade going on. And I don't know if you all know, in, in Indonesia, there's a lot of Christians. There's about 20 million Christians. And there were many Christians that come to Israel from Indonesia um, on, on like pilgrimages. So um, I never felt one bit of anti-Jewish feeling at all. And being in the um, parliament, with the yarmulke, no one said to me, you know, take off your yarmulke or anything. They accepted us, and they, they when they mentioned Israel, everybody applauded. It, it was actually, it was really wonderful. Wow. Well, so you sound like you had a, a this a terrific experience, a very interesting experience. Sounds like you were a great representative for Israel, and 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 for Judaism too. Um, your comments near the end of your presentation about the universality 
of philately were actually kind of moving. And uh, you could see that in the, in the pictures that you showed about how philately um, can bring people together and countries together. And um, I wasn't surprised about the, the interest in your um, uh, Jerusalem uh, presentation among the people there, I was thinking, well, you know, I, it, Jerusalem is a holy city for for Islam as well. So uh, um, I, I'm sure that uh, this was a, an eye-opening experience for those who looked at your presentation. I was having a little trouble with my um, my internet when during the first half of your presentation. So you may have covered some of this, but uh, as I was having the trouble with it, I was looking up. Uh, information about the Jewish community in Indonesia. A lot of it you did cover later on, um, but I, I was really surprised, and you, you mentioned it uh, just a couple of minutes ago, that uh, with this lar large country with a very, very large population, uh, there are only, uh, throughout the country, there are only a couple dozen really people who identify as Jewish and Judaism is not recognized as an official religion of, of Indonesia. And uh, as you were just mentioning, uh, some of the Jew, when they do have services or a, a synagogue or somewhat of a synagogue, they kind of have to meet in, um, in secret and go in there and it has to kind of meet in secret. So um, uh, just a couple of uh, comments and thoughts about your, your presentation, which I thought was very interesting. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> it's very kind of you. Can I just mention, you know, there was something when, when we were in Jakarta in 2012, it was the 10th anniversary of the body bombing. So the security was extremely tight. I mean, the 10th anniversary there, quite a few, I think over 200 people were killed in the terrorist attack in, in, in Bali. And we had, when we traveled, it was, we had like an entourage of police escorts. But what was amazing about the, it also coincided with, I think they had the European soccer championships at the same time as that exhibition was going on. And I told people, and this they could not believe, I said, you know, in the Israeli national team, a third, even more than a third of the players are Muslim. And the captain of Hapal Tel Aviv is Wali Badir, who's a Muslim. And I was actually in, in Haifa where they gave a um, honorary award to the Israeli goalkeeper Nir Davidovich. He got a standing ovation with over 30,000 people. And then they gave Wali Badir also an honorary um, award. And exactly the same amount of people got up and applauded. And, you know, for Indonesians, not only Indonesians, they get Al Jazeera, and the 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 media coverage is always negative. It's so negative. So here, I think they were hearing a different side. They had no idea that there were Muslims playing in the Israeli national team, and that the captain of Hapoel Tel Aviv would be a Muslim. For them, they thought I was, you know, I was pulling their leg, but it was true. And when they checked it out and they saw it was true, I think. It changed their views somewhat, but one doesn't realize how influential the media can be and how it can, so it's a lot through education. So these kids, I don't know if they were going to take the, the envelopes from Israel and then throw it in the bin, but they were genuinely so happy to receive it. So for me, that was, it was such a positive thing. Just as a general comment, I don't know if, if everybody's ever been to a uh, Philatelic um, World Stamp Championship, but they're just superb exhibitions to go to. They're amazing uh, with all the countries that show up and the different exhibits from them. I was even fortunate to attend the one in 2008 that was in Israel. Uh, and that was really a delight uh, for both reasons. Obviously, it was a world championship and it was in Israel. But the, they're really, the exhibits are really something and they're, they're amazing. And so, uh, Les, I applaud you for being willing to be a commissioner and, and take all those exhibits to the different uh, world exhibits. Uh, and this has been a very delightful presentation. Thank you.
Wow, you are so kind. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I wasn't so good with the uh, moving from one video to another. I haven't done this for a long time, but uh, thanks for persevering. But you're very kind. But I just feel, it, it, you know, when they asked me to do it, it was to represent Israel. I don't know, I just felt I was so blessed to do that. And my wife and I, my wife got on very well with the Indonesian ladies. They would take the women on tours. I mean, they really went out of the way to accommodate everyone. I think what they felt is, and we really saw this also in Bandung, there were quite a few European countries that I wouldn't use the word snub, but they just didn't make the effort to come. And those that did make the effort to come, they really, really appreciated it. And I think that's part of the Islam hospitality that they showed tremendous hospitality and they were very grateful. And we were all very grateful to be there. So I wanna thank you, thank you all. Yeah. <clears throat> On behalf of everybody here today, uh, Laz, I'd, I'd like, like to thank you again for the uh, great insight into Indonesia and into Indonesia for latterly and what have you. And it was most interesting. Thank you. Oh, well, Gary, thank you for asking me. And I want to thank you all. And Don, thank you so much for helping me. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. And you're welcome anytime to you're, you're welcome anytime to give us a talk and to come along. To that's the, really, really kind of you. Meetings. Well, I really appreciate it, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Any any more questions for Les before he goes? Will he do my teeth for free, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> I believe he's a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have a long way to come, wouldn't he, Adam? Yeah, yeah. It's just in the news on in the UK at the moment. We're struggling with dentists, aren't we? Well, with the <laughs> NHS, there's a big problem. Not only with dentists, there's a whole thing with the NHS. Yeah. We also we also can't send uh, any. We, we had a we had, we had a Royal Mail strike here, and now we can't even send any international mail abroad. They're now saying that there's been a a cyber attack by Russians or something. What will they think of next? Unbelievable. Yeah, I tried to send some envelopes yesterday to uh, overseas. They wouldn't take it over the counter. Crazy. I did get your envelope. Yes, uh, on Saturday. Good, good. Liz, could you send me your contact information? I'd love to keep in contact with you. Silton. Uh, Hilton, okay, with pleasure. So Hilton, I'll I'll give it to um, give it to Beverly or to, to send Beverly, it to yeah. you. I don't know. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Appreciate well, it. Well, you know what? I'll just put it here for anybody. Um yeah. you know what's what's can I just write it on the on the message? Yeah, sure. On the chat room. Yeah. It's just Liz Glassman at Gmail. Um I'll just put it here. And and what's very nice, what I find um wonderful is with WhatsApp. <laughs> Well. This is also on is also on our contact list as well. So oh okay, his, thank you. His, de his details should be there as well. Thanks, thanks, Gary. Okay. It might be important, Gary, to let those people that uh, were successful in the auction, if they bought from a uh, a UK seller uh, and and they were from abroad, that there might be some delay then. Yes, yeah. Although it's funny because all what I sent out, everybody got theirs within one week, and then I think the cyber attack happened. But yes, there could be a delay. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say I got mine from Rabbi Zayden right away. Right. Good. Good. Yes. It's only just um, like the week after the auction. So yeah. So anything that went off, you probably all got. Has anybody I need to run, got... thank you. I need oh, to run, no. thank you for a beautiful presentation and have a good week, everybody. Thank you, Hilton. I was going to ask Les whether or not I, I know that he said that a lot of the time he was probably within the complex. Did he get the chance to see the old Dutch quarter of Okay, so that's of a Jakarta? Good, uh, Alan, that's a good question. 
So when we were there in 2012, they took us on a tour to the, the old quarter. And it was amazing because one of the, um, the governors, I mean, this is going back when it was under Dutch rule, um, the surname was Kuhn. So I don't know if it was Cohen or if it was Jewish, but um, there was a, a very strong Dutch, it was a Dutch colony for many years. And um, very interesting that a lot of those Dutch Jews that were in Indonesia, um, I don't know, either they, they left the country when they got independence, but today there are not many Jews there at all. Either they, um, they assimilated or, or they left the country. The woman, uh, Maureen Hanna, that you saw in the picture with my wife, a wonderful woman. She's very strong in a Yiddish cart, but her husband wasn't Jewish, but she's brought up her children Jewish. And even Jakob Baruch, the one who is Haredi, who wears a black, uh, his wife's actually Muslim. It's amazing. But he brings up, and she's very accommodating, and she's been in our home. And... Um, He's bringing up his children Jewish, and he knows that one day they, they will need to convert. But she's very um, supportive of him because there's just no young Jewish girls there. Right yeah. But it's fascinating. Uh, the, the old part of uh, Jakarta. Uh, Jakarta, you've got some very modern buildings, but you've got the very old, and there's a lot of poverty, unfortunately, and it's it's all in the open. They built this magnificent tower, it's called Monas Tower, which my wife and I went to. And what was very interesting there, it's the first time ever that I, uh, they had all, all the school kids were waiting like nearly a kilometer to get in, and somebody saw my wife and I, and they said, have you got a couple of dollars and I'll get you in the front of the queue? It's the first time I've ever really done a brand. I just said, Oi, can you do that? And I gave him a few dollars and off we went like VIPs and otherwise we would never have got to the top of the tower. But you see a magnificent panoramic, panoramic view of, this, of the city. And um, but most of those people, they looked at us as, as, as oddities because they don't really see too many um, foreigners coming to Jakarta. Do you, have, do you have any more um, uh, stamp exhibitions you're planning on going to international stamp for So us? there is going to be one in November in um, in Thailand. It's going to be an right. international uh, exhibition. Um, the problem that we have, but Israel, we've been very, very lucky. Um, like I'll give you an idea, the, um, in, in Indonesia, um, in, I think England, um, I don't think England um, exhibited there. There were certain countries that just didn't exhibit. Or um, also now in, in, in Cape Town, there were many countries that, and the reason why they didn't exhibit is that they don't have enough ex ex exhibitions. It's also been very difficult having, with the corona, where for two years there were no exhibitions, and all of a sudden there were so many, all in such a, sh a short span of time. So um, Israel's been very fortunate that people have been very uh, forthcoming with the exhibits and um, and you also have to pay for the, the, the frame fees, which sometimes it can be quite a bit, but they, people are willing to exhibit and to represent, you know, the exhibits, they're very happy to have people see the exhibits and um, in a way they're also representing Israel by showing the exhibits. So we've been, any, exhi any exhibition that Israel's been asked to attend, we've always attended, and we've always managed to get enough exhibits to be able to attend, which is quite, because we're a small country, and, and it's, we've been very fortunate in, in, in doing it, but it's a lot of hard work. When you go to these exhibitions, do you have to pay your own fare, or do you get, do you get financed by these stamp? Um, okay, so this is, this is quite an interesting thing. If you don't bring, and, and I've been to certain exhibits, uh, exhibitions where some of the commissioners didn't bring enough exhibits. So that doesn't cover the, the fees for the uh, org organizing committees. So then you don't get, it's called commissioners privileges. So they don't pay for your hotel. 
So that happened in London. There were quite a few countries that just didn't bring enough exhibits for London. So they had to pay their own way, which can be extremely expensive. So as a, as a commissioner, they do pay for your hotel. And if your wife comes with, it's in the same room. And they pay for part of, you, you get like an allowance, which can go to your airfare or something. But your, for your spouse, obviously, you, you pay yourself. But um, it's getting harder and harder because financially, as I'm sure we all know, like the post office here in Israel isn't running at a great profit. In fact, it's running at a bit of a loss. So a lot of the countries, the postal authorities are suffering. And so the finance isn't there so much anymore. But they, they do help as much. Now, with the judges, I think the judges, they pay for everything. They're there. So also that's... Um, so. But the judges, when they go to exhib an exhibition, as a commissioner, once you put up the exhibits and you attend, you, you have much more free time, which is wonderful because you can tour around in the city that you're in, which is wonderful. Most of the judges, like in, in London, they were there. They couldn't even leave the exhibition hall. So I, I was very fortunate when I was in London, I could see quite a few survivors. I had time to, to meet family and friends and, and to see a few of the survivors. And if I would have been a judge, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Right. You were saying um, before, the same old question, of course, of uh, trying to encourage the, the young the youngsters back into the hobby or into the into the hobby. I don't know what it's like in, in, in Israel or in other countries. You know, when I was younger, we we did have a stamp club in, in, in school. Actually, in those days I, I never collected stamps, so I never went to the never went to the stamp club. But nowadays a lot of the schools in England anyway, they don't have they don't have stamp clubs. And I always say this I think it's not the youngsters we need to educate, it's the adults, the teachers, the people that are, are, ed, uh, are teaching these children. If we can, edu if we can educate the teachers to, to, for them to do stamps and what stamps is all about, I don't know what it's like in, other, in Israel or other countries. So I'll tell you, in Israel, what's interesting, because, you know, there's so much competition now with, uh, with the iPhone and with the uh, kids with all the video programs and and all these um um you have these these games gaming and, and everything so there's a lot of competition for sense but in the more religious world where the internet they don't really allow the kids too much time to go on the internet in fact some places they don't allow them at all so stamps is a window to the world so there you find in the religious circles a lot of the kids do collect the stamps and they're very passionate about it. But um, you are some like you are some young kids that don't even know what a stamp is. They don't even know what a letter is, which is no. actually quite sad. And you're right. It, 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 it's more for the the adults to um, to inculcate this this because it's not only the stamps. But I've been telling people and people that have old letters, they don't realize that in those old letters that was sent from the grandparents it's their history and sometimes you have the letters inside and it's a window to that world that isn't anymore but you you actually if you keep those old letters and you see where your family came from and which towns and it's a postal history is a whole different aspect of of philately and mm. also what's happened now in the philatelic world and this is a very positive development and i saw this now at the new exhibitions They've allowed postcards. Postcards is has become very popular, and it's just postcards without stamps even. But you have to, you know, do a bit of research on who issued the postcards, and it's now become one of the themes that you can exhibit at a world stamp exhibition are postcards, and they've developed a new class which I've actually got an exhibit on. It's called the Open Class. So Open Class is a it's a wonderful invention. That is um, that you can have like a Judaic connection where you can, it has to be 50%. This is the the rule is something quite new. I didn't know this rule until recently. 50% has to be philatelic, but then you can have 50% non-philatelic. So you can have a collection on badges and you can actually show, show the badges, 
but then you must have stamps also with badges or it has to be 50 50. And this is encouraging people who have wonderful collections that aren't only philatelic, but are, it's related or it's a theme on, on the Shoah or anything that they can include non philatelic items as well. And to encourage young collectors or, or new collectors, they also have a one frame exhibitions now. So you can, anybody can start at 16 pages. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful way of, of getting people more interested in, in exhibiting. And it's, it's a fascinating field in, in, in philately now, the one frame. But it has to be confined. You can't have a one frame on like uh, the Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. It has to be a um, specific um, time period that you can only um, have in 16 pages. It has to be on a specific topic. Have you ever come across a guy called David Ball? He uh, he he specialises in I think in astrophilately. So that's also he's, he's a, a, a theme, astrophilately. That's also it's, it's yes. people. Yeah. It's one of the themes which they have at certain exhibitions on astrophilately. Yeah. Well, David works for the Keller auction firm. He's also a member of the society as well. Yeah. Wow. Now, you know, I, I do the stamp collecting merit badge for scouts every every uh, February, and I find that the way to get them interested, the, the youth, is to get them interested in collecting a topic that they already yes. have an interest in. Absolutely, yeah. So I tell you, I, I do have an idea, maybe for for the you know for the Judaic club. There's, when I was in Joburg in 2010, I saw something which for me was, I couldn't believe what I was seeing from New Zealand. There was an exhibit of five frames on the Holocaust. It was called Descent into the Abyss by Bruce Chatterton. And I went to the commissioner and I was, I was really, I was just blown away by this exhibit. It was an incredible exhibit on the history of the Shah of the Holocaust with um, pictures of people and what Bruce had done, he had found out what happened to those people in, in, in the letters. But it, he did so much research on who was in those letters as well. And he's exhibited it, he exhibited it in Israel, in Jerusalem. That exhibit was here in Jerusalem. He actually came to visit me when he came here. He moved to Australia. And now in Cape Town, he exhibited it under open class. And he won a gold medal for it. But he would be wonderful to give a talk on the Zoom on, on his collection because it is... It's just something absolutely incredible, and it's coming from a non-Jew. Um, it's called Dissension to the Abyss. Um, the, we did a, uh, I asked the commissioner and I spoke to Bruce if he could send me um, like pa the pages of his collection, and it was actually put into a book that was published by SRP called Dissension to the Abyss. It is something extraordinary, but he's a wonderful person. Maybe. It's something to think about. To I'm, I'm sure uh, he'd give a wonderful presentation on his connection. Recently, the American Philatelist, the APS magazine, had a cover story uh, on Holocaust. Wow. The, the the whole cover the cover was on the Holocaust, and inside was a number of Holocaust. Uh, uh, stories uh, with the stamps. T. Lee, do you have a copy of it? Because I used to yes, be. Yes, I do. I, I used to be a uh, member for years. Find, I'll have to find it because yeah. I'm in a. I I put it aside somewhere because I'm also uh, vice president of an organization in Phoenix. That's in in uh, right now. We're going to have a Holocaust education center, and and we've raised half the funds. Let's see. And we we've raised half the funds for it already, and uh, it's an eighteen million dollar project. Wow! And for the uh, person who's in charge of the education, works mostly with youth. I put the magazine on the side because I'm showing him how he can use the stamp stories also in the education program. So I will I will find it. Uh, 
If you're, are you an APS member? Yes, yes. All right. No, 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 no. I I'll, used to be. I'll get you no, the, the issue American. You can uh, go to the APS website. I, I, I used to be a member, but I'm a member of so many different societies that uh, of the Royal, well, the APS. Um, no, there I, I was for many years, but now I, yeah. APS I'm members not so much anymore. members have access to all the back issues on their website, so I'll find out what issue it is. And all you have to do is just go into www.stamps.org and uh, and bring it up. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to go, but uh, probably won't see anybody till May. <laughs> Enjoy, enjoy your travels, Manny. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Any, any room in the suitcase? Any room in your suitcase for us? <laughs> I thought you left already. No, tomorrow. <laughs> I leave tomorrow. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I'll watch email and I'll see what's going on. And if there's some place I could actually make a Zoom, then I'll try to do that. But it's on the ship; it's too hard. So, see everybody later. Enjoy. Take care and, and, and safe travels. For Many thanks thank so you. much for joining. I appreciate it. You bet. Well, Les, thank you. And glad to have you in the society. Thank you so much. I'm getting his email. Let's see. This. As you can see, Les, we're, we're a friendly bunch. It's wonderful. That really is wonderful. But Gary, it's something to think about because he's Bruce chatted it. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, and, no, uh, no. I think that would be fascinating. It is. Yes, it would be interesting if you can send me the details or whatever or if you want to contact him for whatever yeah, yes yeah. No, bye thank you okay well gary thank you very much i, I so appreciate it and i really i feel so also i'm, I'm really glad that i'm a member of, of the society as well it's wonderful you, you, you're welcome anytime and uh I'll keep bombarding you with our auction catalog and with our emails. No, no, I will. I'll, I'll miss it. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's see if it's here. Of course, our eldest member is Seymour Nussenbaum. He's 99. Wow. He's 100 this year. Did in May. Did you enjoy the did you enjoy the presentation today, Seymour? Yeah, very much. Yeah. He also has done uh, he used to be a cover designer, he has designed covers in the past. Wow. First day covers. Seymour, do you know these these Nuss Nussbaums from South Africa? Right now. Uh, from these these a family of Nussbaums. They live in Israel now, but there was quite a uh, no, no, I'm not Nussbaum, it's Nussenbaum. Oh, Nussenbaum. Uh -huh. Oh, that's Nussbaum. Sorry, you Nussenbaum. Uh, Les? Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. Wow, that's amazing. This is April, this is, uh, April of 2020 April. edition. Gee, that's incredible. Sure. And if you're an APS member, you can download any back issue. Wow, that's amazing. Sure. At www.stamps.org. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really okay. appreciate it. That's wonderful. Most of it's concentration camp mail. Most of this, the articles. Mm. You know, I think he's a he's been a long member of your society, Zayden, Rabbi Zayden. So well, he look, Rabbi look Zayden, at the yes. bottom at yeah, one of the uh, articles. The making of a Holocaust exhibit. She, that's incredible. Yep. She was. It's amazing. You know Rabbi Zayden, do you, Les? Very well from South Africa, and no, I'm, 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 I know his brother as well. No, I'm, I'm many many years. Uh, 
Anybody else got any stamp news to mention or anything? No? Gary, thank you so much. You're welcome anytime, Les. And Don, thank you very much for helping me. I really appreciate it. Sure. No problem. And I must, I must thank Steve Sattler for finding you. Yes, Steve. <laughs> he, of the, course, the, I'm, the connection I'm gonna, Steve has is amazing. I'm going to find Steve as well. I'm in touch with him a lot. It's amazing yes, the it's, connections, uh, the, the, the people he, he brings to the to the society to, to he's give He's amazing. Talk. Steve, he's, a, he's such an amazing, uh, not only researcher, but his knowledge is encyclopedic. That really is. Yes. Have you had a good week, Seymour? Yeah, very good. Good. Uh, I'm finally getting my uh, Hanukkah stamps out to be cancelled. All right. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you told me that you're not getting any mail in England. So I'll hold. Well, we're, 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 we're getting we're getting mail slowly, but we're not. We can't send any out. Well, I didn't. I didn't send them out yet, so I have to wait for them to come back. All right. Oh, no I'll hurry. Send them out. <laughs> yeah. No, so that's why I sent a lot of stuff out to everybody that I was saving. And I held yours because I didn't want him to get it stuck in the mail in the mail strike. Yeah. It's there's not much stamps in there anyway. There is a banana stamp, but uh, <laughs> but there's a there's more banana stickers than there is stamps. <laughs> Here's an interesting question for you, Les. Um, yeah. So happens I have a collection that, I've, well, I bought it actually off eBay. Somebody was selling a written up collection of uh, about bananas on stamps. So I've got this bananas on stamps and there's postcards and there might even be an odd coin, all, all banana related. My question to you is, obviously this person has written it up and what have you. Can, if you, if you buy a collection, like I bought that, if I put it into, a, into an exhibit, can I, can I class it as mine? <laughs> it's a very, very, very uh, interesting question. And, you know, there, there was actually an exhibit that I saw in Cape Town almost on the, right. rise, the rise of the Third Reich. It was right. somebody from, from Brazil. And I asked him, where did you get this material? I mean, this is incredible, unbelievable material. And he said most of it he actually bought. But what, what, what he did is he, he rearranged it and he rewrote part of it and he put it together. So the whole thing with exhibiting, uh, I mean, it could you could inherit an exhibit. Um, they're not so strict on if you buy one, but they don't want it to be like a checkbook, a checkbook exhibit. In other words, if you buy um, items from uh, uh, say an auction house and you just put their description, you just put it without doing your own research or just putting it on pages, they're going to know that it's it's called a checkbook exhibit. But if you put it in a story or you use those items and you just make it into a story, for sure, you, of course you can. That's, that's never been an issue. Yeah. And you can make it to such a fascinating subject. And uh, that could be in the open class, a one frame even, where you have uh, stickers, <laughs> they're all related to but it's such an interesting topic on bananas and banana-shaped I think Sierra Leone, they did those issues of they, banana, banana shaped stamps. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. maybe postcards made banana shaped, or there's so many things. It's, it's such an interesting, fascinating thing. So you could make it, in, do you have a, enough to make it into 16 pages? It's finding the time to, I mean, it's, Judaica is my main, my, main, my main theme. It's finding the time to do it. I mean, I've got it all yeah. there, you see, but I've never. Yeah. So Gary, it's something nice because once you exhibit, it's 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 a whole different world. You know, I tell you, when you exhibit, um, you're meeting other exhibitors and they give you advice, and it's just it's and people are there to help, and they want everyone to do well, and they want, you know, so you you just get such wonderful advice, and then somebody might see your exhibit and say, you know, I've got an item, let's swap, or do you want to buy one of mine? So you and you really improve. It's the only way that I, I was very fortunate to get for the Mozambique account.
But when I started, it wasn't a gold, not at all. And I don't have the best material. I don't have the most expensive either. But I've put so much research into it. And so many people have given me such wonderful advice through the years that I really put a lot of time and effort into it. And I made it into quite a nice collection. But it's not that it's very valuable and it deserves to be a gold. But if you're spending time compiling so many frames for an exhibit, aren't you neglecting your own collection? No, not at, not at all. The opposite, no. I find it the opposite. By, by doing what I've done, um, when in that high IRS, I'll show you that high IRS presentation that they came to my home. I didn't know they were going to do that. They didn't tell me I'm we're making a video. They just took photographs and then they just sent it to me. I couldn't believe what they were doing. And they just made it into a video. I didn't ask for it. I couldn't. And Hirates is a very left-wing publication, but I was quite impressed that they wanted to come to my home and to do it for me. Um, and they did it voluntary. But what happened is in that exhibition, I think it was in Tel Aviv in 2008, um, there's one cover, Kibrit. Um, it's a Mozambique cover. It was sent from um, Bara to Alexandria. And I, I show that cover and then I get a phone call. Somebody contacted the Israeli Philatelic Federation and said they need to buy that cover urgently. They have to have that cover. So they said to me, am I willing to sell it? I said, it's not valuable at all. You know, I don't know. I've got it in auction. I haven't paid much for it. A couple of dollars even. It's not. It's just that the destination is interesting. So I said, no, the reason why they want it is that their family is Kibbridge. And they never knew that there was a branch. They knew there was a branch in Alexandria. They didn't know that there were Kibbritz also in Bara in Mozambique. So I said, you know what? I will make you a color photocopy of the, 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 the reverse side of the cover, the cover, there's no lead inside. And I'll and I'll give you the, the photo color, the photo. It's just as good as nearly as good as the original, you know. And they were very happy with that. But by exhibiting it, it's amazing because I met a family that really was connected, you know, it comes, it comes alive. And so many things when you exhibit, people will say, wow, um, you can do this differently or they give you different advice on what to do. So you really grow from it. So my whole focus has been on exhibiting rather and writing it up. And then you put it in journals and people give you advice and you, it's, it's just, it's a whole different part of philanthropy. Mm -hmm. It's really, uh, it's really, really, I, I can't tell you how, it's a, it's a different part of philanthropy which you, you really will enjoy because you're getting, you'll be meeting or people will contact you and because people are fascinated and when they see it, you're sharing it with others as well. And it doesn't take so long. You know, you write it up, but what's good is now at one time they wanted color pages. Now it's gone back to white pages. They want people to exhibit on white pages, not with the black Harvard strips anymore. Just you know, just have it on white pages with the plastic covers, uh, and each stamp mustn't be hinged, they must put in like uh, plastic um, protective, um, you know, that, that protects the stamp. But and how it mounts, yeah, yeah, but not 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 with the black before they were always with a black border. Now they don't be want clear mounts, they must be clear mounts because I did mine also once with maroon behind it, looked nice, but now. If you do put with maroon, that shows it's an exceptional item. So if you had a, re a red background, instead of writing, you know, just it points out to the judges that this is an exceptional item. So there have been different rules. I would ask somebody who's exhibiting uh, before you start writing a whole, you don't want to write it and then have to rewrite it and rewrite it. So just ask somebody who's quite, um, who does quite a bit of exhibiting, you know, what the rules are and uh, they'll help you. Well, I'll help you. You can see me pictures and I'll help you. Not that I'm an expert, but I'll, I'll do whatever I can. I'll help you with the greatest of pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> You're muted, Lee. You're muted. Okay. Uh, this is an 11-year-old American Philados magazine with this three-page story in it called the Jewish Committee in Nazi Germany in the post-war period. Wow. There's a number of stories and you can probably uh, look at indexes and, and all it's these amazing. are available on the website, the whole, the whole magazine. 
And this particular issue is March of 2011 of the American Philatelist Magazine. I'm saving these for the uh, Holocaust Education Center when I find them, but I have over 300 issues of the, Amer mm -hmm. of the American Philatelist. And at the Airpex stamp show, I'm boxing them all up and putting them on the giveaway table. And inside, I'm gonna have two postcards for them to uh, send in for membership information. So I'm using it as a membership drive for the APS. Wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be 81 years old and I don't need hundreds of magazines laying around the house. Mm. <laughs> that, that'll be just that much weight that the, uh, my family is going to have to put in recycled cans. <laughs> Gee, Lee, that's a, you don't look at you don't look at anyone. Gee, that's amazing. So, so in in so in in, in reality, uh, I'm looking for issues as I'm uh, I'm looking at the indexes as I put them away. I already got boxed up uh, two boxes of fifty each. And I think those boxes are too heavy for me to lift. Oh. So I might have to take about 10 out of each one because these magazines weigh close, you know, no. weigh okay. like uh, 12, 12, 13 ounces a piece. So, Lee, Lee, can I make a suggestion? You, you should contact the SIP, the Society of Israel Philately. Just you go on their website, SIP, and you should get, you should tell who's doing the Holocaust education. That oh. book, the book called Descent into the Abyss by uh, Bruce Chatterton, it is absolutely, but unbelievably amazing. Because, yeah, I'll check it out. I am an SIP member. Yeah, so it's called Descent into the Abyss. I actually uh, I sent a copy of that book to the Royal in London, and they asked me to do a review on the book, which for me was the greatest pleasure to do. But he's done something that no, no one's ever done. Imagine he took a letter and he saw who the letter was, and then he managed to get all the information on what happened to the person I've who seen that. Letter. I have seen that. I remember that. That's I amazing. do that myself. Wow. I have, uh, I have, uh, like, I have a Palestine court document that's got British, uh, it's got the Palestine court stamps, and, and this is from the 1920s, by the way, and uh, I bought a lot from a Canadian auction of Palestine court documents with basically for all the revenue stamps on them. But this one also has, has uh, British consulate revenue stamps on it. And the document originated in Alexandria. And, and it's, uh, it's from Alexandria, it, it, it originated. And what happened was, uh, it basically is the document that a, a woman, and I think the last name was A-W-A-R-S, which by the way, there's a lot of them in Israel. I checked it up, I checked it out, that enlisted her and that she was the widow of, and they got her husband's name and the mother of, and there were like nine or 10 children. And it was then uh, registered or canceled with Palestine court documents in Jerusalem, court stamps, court, court fee stamps. And what I found out, because this is a lot of them are in Arabic, the Arabic and Hebrew, but this was in English, that this was actually the document for her and her children to leave Alexandria and move to Palestine. That's what the document's for. And, and I'd like to turn things over it's history or at least copies to those families. I did find one that was a non-Jewish, uh, non-Jewish uh, New York Times uh, reporter who won a Pulitzer, by the way, for other stuff. And he, in the 1940s, he was in uh, 19, this was in before, this was Palestine. He was in Jerusalem. He was the Jerusalem correspondent post World War II. He was a World War II, and this was before Israel. And he got married to a Jewish gal, evidently Polish from Poland, 
And this was the marriage document, the original. And it's the U.S. consulate stamps and everything on it. And what I ended up doing with it, I looked it up. And the Newberry Library in Chicago had all his, di his papers and as, as, as part of their collections. And I knew somebody that worked at that library. So I called her up and sent her a photocopy of the documents. And they said they would love to have it. So I gave it to them. Gee, it's amazing. Sure. So, because a lot of these documents have a lot of history, especially families. Yeah. But, but I can't read he Hebrew. I can't uh, translate Hebrew or Arabic. And, uh, and, and a lot of the documents are in Hebrew and Arabic, and they're all with, with Palestine court stamps uh, on it. And I don't know how they got out into the stamp market, but I would assume that there was a lot of pilfering going on, especially during the 1948 and 47 period. And uh, I bought it. I bought it, uh, actually uh, a friend of mine was interested in a lot because it had Swiss revenues, but over half the lot was Palestine. He wasn't interested in it. So he asked me, he said, if I, if I buy the lot, would you go 50-50 on the price and you get the Palestine documents and I'll take the Swiss ones. And that's what we did. Wonderful, it's cheap. It's incredible. Huh? Hopefully today, Les, today's been, excuse me, hopefully today's been interesting for you as well, meeting, it's, meeting it's people wonderful, and also wonderful. Getting, getting information as well. It's been really special, very special, Mom. incredibly special. I'll see you welcome anytime. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it, really. Are you retired now from dentistry? Are no, you no, 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 no. <laughs> No, I'm still working right. pretty hard, but it's uh, it's okay. Um, just choose day off the, today. No, but today I actually I'll tell you today I met somebody who's 88, who's a Holocaust survivor from from France, an amazing woman, incredible lady, that knew Clausewitz, and um, and it was just amazing being in her home and uh, she's relating her, you know, what happened to her during the war. It's just for me that that's just wow. It's it's, it's so 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 special. Mm. Well, I think we'll we'll close the meeting now, unless anybody's got anything else to say. Or well, thank you very very much. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been it's been fabulous uh, listening to you. Seymour, have you got anything to s tell us this week? No. No, not really. It's all week getting those covers ready. Right, right. But I have a lot. You're, al you're always busy. You always, you, you always find, you always busy doing things, Seymour. What else am I going to do? Put on my thumbs. Huh. Well. See you all. See you all next week. Then all being well. Okay, Good. Gary. Thank you so much, and thank, thank you, everybody. Everybody. all the best. You're welcome. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank, thank you for the good presentation, much. and thank you, Don, for hosting. Thank, thank you, Don, and thank you all for next week. thank you all for Bye. attending, and I really appreciate it. All the best. No, no we we, th we thoroughly enjoyed it. Any any time. Okay. God bless. Bye.